God's ministering spirits. Today, we are turning our attention to a group of angels who actually seem to be the reason for many of the ideas about angels having wings. I am, of course, talking about the seraphim and the cherubim. Both of these types of angels are described in Scripture as having wings. Now, with all due respect, the description given of the cherubim is the strangest of all of the angelic host. I'm not going to talk about them. We'll get to that group later. They deserve a message of their own just because of the way they look. Okay? But today is all about the seraphim. Now, all of the angels were created by God. They're all created beings. They were created by God before man. And they were present at the creation of this earth. Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Now, according to the book of Job, Job had said some things that he shouldn't have said. He seemed to have a habit of that, actually. So God challenged him one day over some of this stuff. Now, basically, what God was telling Job was, I know a whole lot more than you do. After all, I made everything. So in Job chapter 38, verses 4 through 7, in the NIV, we have this. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me, if you understand, who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? Or, or on what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? Wow. See, the angels were created before the earth, and the angels got to watch earth's creation. And when they saw it, they shouted for joy. I wish mankind would catch up. Angels are always thrilled about what God does. And we ought to be. Amen? Amen? Now, pardon the interruption, but I see people hugging themselves. That means they're cold. So if we could adjust that, okay? Uh, I, I know it's going to mean walking up to the thermostat. I'm sorry, but if you'd take care of that, okay? Because it's cold up here. Now, back to the message. We are the centerpiece of God's creation. Amen? We are made in the image and the likeness of God. Now, I often think about how sad it is to see God's creation being so much unlike God. And frankly, I think it makes God very angry when He sees it. And I'm talking about a holy anger. I'm talking about a righteous anger. Actually, I'm talking about an anger that is being stirred up right now in this nation. I've said it before by the Spirit of God. I'm going to say it again. America was God's idea. Thank God for George Washington. But America was not George Washington's idea. America was God's idea. 
This is God's country. This is God's land. It is no joke when we say in God we trust. We are one nation under God. So what happens here is of great importance and great concern to God. And there are a lot of liberal people that are stirring up God's anger right now. Well, how can you say that? Oh, it's quite simple. He said, vengeance is mine. I will repay. Now, that does not sound real sweet to me. I like that song. Maybe you know it, maybe you don't. Sweet Jesus, sweet Jesus, what a wonder you are. But today I kind of want to sing, Mad Jesus, Mad Jesus. <laughs> what a wonder you'll be. Let her rip, Lord. Yeah. But now keep in mind, the major focus of God's anger is aimed at Satan. He's what's behind this. Every evil thing that happens, it falls back to him. And we have to keep that in mind. But now going forward, on the other hand, nothing, say nothing. nothing. Say it again. Nothing, nothing in Scripture comes close to indicating the angels were made in the image and likeness of God. Nowhere. Nothing in Scripture even implies that. In fact, the opposite must be true. For example, when Jesus appeared to the disciples after His resurrection, they thought He was just a spirit. Remember that? And this was Jesus' response. It's Luke 24, 39. Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. The resurrected Jesus had, the resurrected Jesus has flesh and bones. But it ain't like your flesh and bones. How do you know? Simple. Get up, walk through that wall. <laughs> See what happens to your flesh. And to your bones. They will not be the same. So this new body that you're going to have has flesh and bones. You're not going to be little Casper floating around heaven. After all, you got streets made of pure gold to walk on. Lord, I want feet with bones in them and flesh so I could walk up and down those streets. You think about what I'm saying to you now. Now, we are told in the book of Hebrews that angels are spirits. Are they not, can you finish it? Ministering spirits. So if a spirit does not have flesh and bones, then the angels do not have flesh and bones. Because they're spirits. But they can certainly appear to have flesh and bones. 
those that I have seen, both those that I could see in this realm with these natural eyes and those that I've seen looking over into the realm of the Spirit, every one of them gave the appearance of having flesh and bones, but the truth of the matter is they didn't. Now that's pretty remarkable when you think about it. I don't want to park there too long. I've got too much other sermon to go on here with. But I'm just trying to stir you up a little bit and get you to think. Because I do think there's an awful lot of Christians that they have some kind of weird mystical idea of what happens to us whenever we leave this body. And then they just kind of think we're just kind of floating around, you know, some kind of thing or something. No. You're a real you in that body. Yes, you are. It's a real real body that you're going to have. Now, we call ourselves spirit beings. I am a spirit. I have a soul. I live in a body. Spirit beings. But now wait a minute. Right now we have flesh and bones. So how do we reconcile this? Simple. It's your body that has the flesh and bones, not your spirit. There's not a spirit skeleton on the inside of your body. Okay? Now, there is much, much more to us being made in the image and likeness of God than the fact that we have a body. As a matter of fact, most of the time when you hear people trying to describe, what does that mean? Made in the image and likeness of God. I have actually heard arguments in theology classes about what color God's eyes are. <laughs> what color is His hair? That's foolishness. See, the truth of the matter is our human body is the part of us that is the least like God. Our human body. We're going to leave this body behind when we do go to heaven. Whether it's by way of the grave or whether it's by way of the rapture, this body is not going. But when we receive a new body, it will be very much like God's body. If you want me to be more specific, if you want to know what your new body is going to be like, read everything you can about the way Jesus was after the resurrection, and that will give you the best opinion, the best idea, the best concept, the best information about what that new body is going to be like. I'll just tell you now, that new body like seafood. <laughs> That's right. Jesus ate fish. That's right. Now that might bother somebody because there's probably somebody here that does not like seafood. Anybody here not like seafood? It's okay if you don't like it. You don't like seafood? Really? You don't like seafood? Anybody else? You ate all you can see? Well, so do I. See, this just kind of freaks some people out. But, but I love fried crawfish. But don't put any seasoning on them. I love lobster. Wow, that's good stuff. Some people don't like it. Jesus does. Why, why y'all just keep messing with my sermon here? I'm trying my best to go on. Now, you're going to get a new body. Aren't you glad? I'm thrilled. I'm going to get a new body. This one is going to do everything I needed to do while I'm here, but, but someday I'll get rid of this one and I'll get a new body. And it'll be like the one Jesus has. Jesus still has that body. That body is over 2,000 years old. Amen. 
And I'll guarantee you, if Jesus gets down on the floor, he doesn't have any trouble getting up. <laughs> you, you can figure that one out, can't you? Yeah. I'll tell you something else I like about that new body. It doesn't gain weight. Your robe will always fit. And it will, yeah, mine will have hair. Yeah. Much younger, yeah. Y'all are doing good. Now think about this. Being made unlike God seems to have been at the very core of the downfall of Lucifer. He was determined to be different to the way God made him. Now think, the very fact that Lucifer wanted to be like God, the very fact he wanted to be like God, is proof enough he was not like God. He was not created in God's image, or he never would have said, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the most God. He would not have said that if he was already like God. He was not already like God, therefore he was not created in the image and likeness of God. And therefore that tells us that the angels were not created like God. But we were. And one of the most destructive things we can do is to try to be something God has not created us to be. I've seen people's lives destroyed. I mean utterly destroyed because God did not create them to be in the ministry. But they were determined to be in the ministry anyway. And I've seen people literally wiped out over that. Lose everything. Marriages blow up. Kids won't speak to them. All kinds of... Why? Because they're trying to be something God did not make them to be. You got awful quiet there for some reason. I've seen the same thing in other places, you know. God did not create me to be the governor of Oklahoma. If I ran for governor, it would destroy me. Hello? Now there might be somebody here and God created you to be the president of the United States. Could be. But he didn't create me to be the president of the United States. See, we've all got to find our place. What did God put me here for? What did God create me for? Once I figure out, once I discover what God created me for, then I can get in that, I can flow with that, and that is the pathway to favor in your life is doing what God created you to do. It's sad how many people never find that. It's really sad. But you see, the devil knows all of this. He tried it, and he failed. And have you ever thought about this? In all of his temptations of man, the devil is trying to get man to be be something which is the opposite of what God created him to be. God created you to be honest, so be a liar. God created you to be holy, And pure, so be a pervert. God created you to be respectful of things that belong to other people, so just get full of envy. God created you to live, so do things that make you die. Do you follow that? In other words, we know certain things God created us to be. So anytime we run headlong into something that's in diametrical opposition 
to what we know God created us to be, you ought to know immediately that's of the devil. Okay, send this message to the White House. All liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. And you don't get let off the hook just because you're an old man. Come on. Lying is of the devil. Lying is of the devil. The devil is a liar and the father of lies, and the truth is not in him. Doing the opposite of what God created us to do will destroy us. We know that. And that's the path the devil took. And that's the path he keeps trying to get people to take today. Now, going forward, it is the fact that we were created in the image of likeness of God. It is that fact that thrills the angels. They look at us. And when they look at us, they see something that reminds them of God. Oh, you got to get on with this. Say it out loud, just like this. Anytime, Anytime. an angel looks at me, angel looks I, remind them of God. I remind them of God. That's why they want to help you. That's why they want to protect you. That's why they want to strengthen you. That's why they want to bring messages to you. That's why they'll battle the prince of the power of the air on your behalf. Is because you remind them of God because you're made in His likeness and His image. Now, the more you can wrap your head around this, the more you can embrace what I'm saying to you, the easier it will be to ask the angels to minister for you when we get to that. See, we got too much of this in Christianity where the angels are up here on a pedestal and when we're just little lowly worms here on the earth eking out a living. That's from the pits of hell. That's a lie. Say it out loud. I'm made in God's image. I'm made in God's likeness. When angels look at me, look at me. I, remind them of God. I remind them of God. Wow, I like that. Now, on the opposite side of this, it may be that the reason we find angels so fascinating is due to the fact that the angels are not created like God. That could be part of it. They're not like God, they're not like us. And in some cases, the description of them, okay, strange. We're going to talk about that here in a moment. It could be that actually we think about the angels as a way of trying to understand more things about God that are not made clear to us by the rest of creation. After all, the angels are with God all the time. They know Him. They know things, and they have seen things that we don't know and that we have never seen. And that intrigues us. And it calls us, come, learn this, know about this. For example, God can be everywhere at once. Don't try to tell me you understand that. You just know it's true. He's here. He's in South Africa right now. He's in Australia. He's in England. He's everywhere all the time. And the angels can fly and they can move so fast that they almost seem like they're everywhere at once. But they're not. But you see, by comparison, we are so very limited by our movement and, and in our movement about the earth that it makes us wonder why God made us so slow. I didn't mean to say that like that, but, <laughs> but you got the message. 
By comparison, we move pretty slow. Why? Well, maybe it wasn't God's intent. Maybe what slowed us down was the fall. Think about that. Okay. Now let's talk about the seraphim. There's only one place in the Bible where the seraphim are mentioned by this name. They're mentioned twice, and it is in Isaiah chapter 6. I'm going to read it, verses 1 through 7. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face. And with twain he covered his feet. And with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphim unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. The seraphim appear to have some very specific duties. And these two I can identify at least. They seem to be the caretakers of God's throne. From what we can tell, and this is all we're told about them specifically, but somehow they seem to have something to do with surrounding the caretakers, I'll call them, of God's throne. And secondly, they continuously shout praises about the Lord of hosts. Now, please, please listen carefully to what I'm about to say, because I do do not want to be misunderstood. I have always thought of this. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. I have always thought of this as these angels speaking this directly to God. But then I noticed in several translations, these words, one cried unto another. And said, holy, 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 the Lord of hosts. These angels were talking to each other. I didn't bring this up just to drop it there. I'm just getting started. Say it out loud. The seraphim, the seraphim. Yell, at one yell at one another. I want you to remember that. Loudly. Yeah. Loudly. Too many churches are too meek and mild and soft in their praise and worship. Like somebody said one time, well, you know, wh why are you shouting? God's not nervous. He's not deaf either. He's neither one. They're shouting. They're right there at the throne. But notice again, they cried one to another. They were saying loudly to each other, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And when I saw that, my thoughts just went immediately to this understanding that we have of praise and worship. When we sing, we sing to the Lord. 
because we are worshiping Him. When we sing about the Lord, we are praising the Lord. Now, both of those are appropriate. But the night that the Lord walked in my hotel room and sat down on the edge of the bed and began to talk to me, after the first few minutes I asked him, is it okay if I ask you some questions? He said, sure. What do you want to know? And I said, well, Lord, there's things that I've always wondered about and I've tried to find out and I've asked other people and nobody seems to know that I know. If anybody knows these answers, they're not telling me. He said, well, what is it? I said, well, I want to know what is the difference in praise and worship? I said, now, Lord, from all I can figure out is praise is singing fast songs. <laughs> and worship is singing slow songs. He said, well, where'd you get that idea? I said, well, all the churches that I go to, they say we're going to enter into a time of praise. And boy, they take off with the music, and it's the fast I can't keep up. And finally they say, now we're going we're to slow down and we're going to worship God. Then we start singing slow stuff. You know what he said? Nothing. He couldn't talk for laughing. He just laughed. He said, that has nothing to do with praise and worship. Nothing. I said, well, then what's the difference? He said, Ken, this is the difference. When you're singing to me, you're worshiping me. He said, when you're singing about me, you're praising me. And I said, yeah, that makes sense. He said, well, then try this one. What do you think is happening when you're singing about yourself? He said, you're praising yourself. What do you think is happening when you're singing to yourself? You're worshiping yourself. And, and I'm sitting there and I'm kind of in shock at this point because about 90% of the songs that I know just flew out the window. I mean, some songs that I really like. But I figured, that's about me. That's about me. That mentions Jesus, but even when it mentions Jesus, it's about me. So I decided a lot of stuff I wouldn't sing anymore. Amen. Amen. And then about that time, the Lord said, try that out on the devil. Because you see, when that happened that night in 1993, when that happened, the church was singing quite a few songs about the devil. About the devil. And singing to the devil. And I tell you what, I got up the next morning and I said, never, ever, ever will you hear from these lips any song that's about the devil or that speaks to the devil. It's not coming out of this mouth. Y'all got time for a story? <laughs> I'll get this sermon introduced eventually. I know where we're going with this. So I'm not lost. But not long after that, I went to a church in uh, South Carolina. North, South Carolina, yeah, to hold a meeting. And uh, the youth group was leading the worship that Sunday morning. And they had a favorite song. And it went something like this. I went to the enemy's camp and it took back what he stole from me. Took back what he stole from me. And boy, they sang that song. I mean, they just got with it. They sang and they saw. They was just having a ball. Well, I'm kind of rude. It's just another word for bold. Y'all okay? You know what happened whenever I took the service. 
I'll tell you exactly what happened. I addressed it. I said, now, listen, kids, and all you adults, you pay attention too. You just sang, I went to the enemy's camp. I said, now, please tell me, some of you, where is that? Where is the enemy's camp? Where do you find that? And finally, one honest person said, hell. I said, are you going to tell me the last few minutes I've been here in your church, y'all all went to hell? And there was a gasp. And I said, and then you're going to try to tell me you went to hell and you took back everything the devil stole from you? What was your stuff doing in hell in the first place? And bless his heart, one of those young men in that youth group stood up and said, Thank you, sir. We will never sing that song again. And I said, Buddy, you just grew some today, didn't you? He said, I sure did. If you don't get anything else out of this message, please get this out of it. It's important who you're singing to and who you're singing about. It is vitally important who you're singing to and who you are singing about. And if you'll pay any attention in a service, pay close enough attention, you will see, you will feel, literally feel the atmosphere in a service shift according to the music during what's supposed to be praise and worship, whether or not we're singing about God, whether or not we're singing about ourselves, whether or not we're singing to God, whether or not we're singing to ourselves, you can literally feel it. And this is why Pastor Donna works so diligently to make sure we only sing songs about the Lord, or especially we sing songs to the Lord and not about ourselves, but rather to Him and about Him. Amen. Amen. Now, some people have not figured out all this stuff that I just said, and so they just think, well, we need new songs. We need something that's new and different. That does not mean it is good. Amen. Just because it's new and different. Besides, hey, the seraphim have been singing the same song for thousands of years. And they're not tired of it, neither is God. Amen. Come on. I'm working up to something. And I don't know how this is going to hit you. So I'll just give up and just throw it at you. Here we go. Guy told me one time, he said, man, whenever you preach, it's meat. He said, the problem is you don't slice it thin. <laughs> you just throw chunks of meat at us. Well, catch this one. As holy and perfect and as wonderful as the seraphim are, they are depicted as praising the Lord of hosts. They're singing about Him to each other. So now I have a very curious question. As the seraphim are doing that, are they waiting for us to worship? The redeemed of the Lord can worship God like no other creature in the universe. Amen. They can praise Him, but we can worship Him. Stay with me. I've just got this introduced. They can praise Him, but we can worship Him. Why? Because God gave His only begotten Son for us. 
Jesus did not die for the angels. Jesus did not give new life to the angels. Jesus did not redeem the angels from a life of sin. As humans, we stand in a place where no other creatures in the universe stand. Having been made in the image and the likeness of God, and then having been stained by sin, and having been cut off from God, and having been dead in our trespasses and sin, and then redeemed and made holy and righteous, we have an ability and we have a desire to express our gratitude and our love and our adoration to God, which goes far beyond anything the angels, including the seraphim, can ever comprehend. Amen. And that does not upset the angels. It does not make them envious. They gladly, they readily keep an atmosphere prepared for our worship of the Lord of hosts. What we do is considered very special in and among the ranks of those in heaven. Now, I'm not going to get off into my opinion about a lot of the stuff that goes on today in the, in, in the, in the name of praise and worship. I don't have to. You know about that stuff. But once you understand what I'm saying to you right now, it puts a whole different light on a church creating a barroom scene and calling it praise and worship. It's true, folks. I'm just being raw and honest with you. I'm just getting started. I really am. The seraphim know their purpose, and they sing like it. Do we know our purpose when we sing? We don't just sing to make ourselves feel good. We sing to the Lord to worship Him. Now I'm going to repeat this core thought, because I've said a lot of stuff in between. As holy, as perfect, as wonderful as the seraphim are, they seem to only praise the Lord of hosts. They wait and they set the atmosphere for us to worship the Lord. Now, I'm not going to be dogmatic about that. Because this little passage in Isaiah chapter 6, that's all the detail we're given. That's it. That's the totality of it. There are other places you can go and you can think, well, I, I kind of think maybe that's a seraphim there. But you're not told that it is. We're not given that specifically. In this passage... This is it to say, we know this about the seraphim, and what we know is they're yelling, holy, 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 to one another. Not to God. That's the way they're depicted. And so based on that, these are my thoughts. And that's why I'm sharing them. They are, just say it out loud, these, what we just heard, these are, my pastor's thoughts about seraphim. He's not writing a book with a new angel doctrine. Just want to make that clear. Okay? It's good for you to think. The redeemed of the Lord can offer very special worship to the Lord. The angels have never known the horror of of being separated from God, and neither have they ever known the joy of then being brought back into relationship with the king of the universe. Redemption creates a level of worship like nothing else can. Amen. Now, I'm going to go back to this passage. And boy, I found some, some cool stuff. The Lord was sitting on a throne. And that throne was higher than everything else. And he had on a robe. And that was huge. And it had a train. And it filled the temple. 
Now, y'all know that I can be a bit ornery. If you're not from Arkansas, y'all don't know that word. I don't know how you say it in New York, but does that work? Okay. But they'd read this in Sunday school when I was a kid. And his train filled the temple. Now you can imagine what went through my mind. God's sitting on the throne. Here comes a (laughs) choo-choo. Do you know they never explained that once? So I grew up as a kid thinking God's got a train. God's got a train. I'm going to heaven right on God's train. Well, I grew out of that, of course. And now I think of it more like this. I have performed weddings where the train that was attached to the bride's dress was so long that she had to have attendants that would move that thing. What's really, really amazing is she walks up the aisle at the back of the church. Somebody's got to get that thing straight behind her so she doesn't wipe a few people out as she's coming up the aisle. (laughs) And once she gets up here, she's going to turn around. And when she turns around, she's here like this, and the train is there. And now she's got to turn, and she's got to get out of here somehow whenever the guy kisses her, you understand? And and so now she turns, and she's all tied up in this thing. And somebody's got to move the train. Maybe that's another job of the seraphim. They're the train movers. I don't know. Because the whole thing full of the temple. It's full of the train. You're never going to forget this sermon, are you? <laughs> well, verse 2 says, above it stood the, pharisim, fer, the seraphim. Now, here's a better wording. Flaming creatures, flaming creatures with six, fing, six wings. Flaming creatures with six wings each were flying over him. The Hebrew word that is translated seraphim in other places is translated as fiery or burning creatures. These creatures have an appearance like they are literally on fire. Think about that. Yet they can fly. And they have six wings. And the use of those wings is specified. It's amazing that of all the stuff we're told about these creatures, there's this focus on their wings. They have six of them. Two of them cover their face. Two of them cover their feet. And they use two of them to fly. Now most of the focus that I've ever heard was placed on the flying wings. But I saw something else. These angels apparently do not look at God. They do not look up on God. They cover their face with two of their wings. Now, I cannot really explain why they do that, but they do it. We're told they do it. But then it spurs this thought. In the Old Covenant, we have these instructions that God gave to Moses. Exodus thirty three twenty. He said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. That is old covenant. Now listen to the new covenant. Hebrews 4.16. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help at the time of need. 1 John chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. And we have known and believed the love that God hath for us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because, because, because as he is, so are we in this world. 
And then we have this exciting news. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. Now the Lord is that Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with uncovered face, we all, with uncovered face, Beholding us in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. We will not stand before God with our faces covered. In fact, we don't do that now. Ours is a different relationship because we have been made the righteousness of God in Him. We are bold in our relationship with God because of His love for us. Then I saw something else. It's about the covered feet. Our feet are covered, but not with wings. Ephesians 6.15, our feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So we have the peace of God because we receive the good news and we spread it everywhere we go. So we stand before God with open face with His peace on our feet. Glory to God. Glory to God. Thank God for the seraphim. They're amazing creatures. But I, and I got some more to say about them. But I'm telling you, being alive unto God, being His child, having Him as my Father, I would not trade places with any of the angels. If I could, I wouldn't do it. And I'm sure you understand that. But now think of what I just said to you. Here is this amazing, amazing revelation given to Isaiah. These rather strange looking creatures, six wings. Two of them covering their face. Two of them covering their feet. They're flying with those other two. I guess you could say they've got a backup system. They don't need it. You understand. But they're flying around. And as they're flying around, they're saying loudly to each other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And then... Here we come in boldly to the throne of grace with our faces uncovered. We just walk right in. We we don't have something hiding our feet. We got peace on our feet. And we just walk right into the throne saying, Father, I just came to talk to you. I just came to worship you. You are holy. You are the most holy. You are the most high God. You are the most glorious of all. Oh, you are, you are loved so deeply by all of us. We love you, Lord Jesus. And boldly we stand there and we speak to our Father. And all the while the seraphim are flying around saying, Holy, holy. They're talking to one another and we're standing here boldly with our face uncovered and with peace on our feet and we're talking directly to our Father. Hallelujah. 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 Now, yes, I've thought about the next thing in Isaiah 6. This is what the praises of the seraphim caused. The post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Now, I have looked at this so many times, and I thought, wow, I want to be in a meeting like that. (laughs) Well, what about this? Acts 4, 29 through 31. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word, by stretching forth thine hand to heal, 
and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of the holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness. So I tell you what I'm saying. Lord, stretch forth your hand to heal. Lord, stretch forth your hand to heal. Lord, stretch forth your hand to heal. Lord, that signs and wonders may be done by the name of your holy child, Jesus. And I'll keep saying it until this place literally shakes. Glory to God. When God responds to the praises of the seraphim, the very throne of God shakes. When God responds to the bold worship of His people, declaring the word of the Lord, the earth shakes. Remember the story? Acts chapter 16, verses 25 and 26. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them, and there suddenly was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bands were loosed. I have the personal cell phone number for the managing partner of this shopping center. Some of you figured out where I'm going next. I can't wait to make the call. (laughs) David, we were having church this afternoon. And I guess we got a little carried away and got caught up in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> and, and, and David, you know that post that used to be right there in the middle of the auditorium that the camera was attached to? You saw that when you was here. Well, that's kind of crooked now. <laughs> I know what his response would be. Well, was anybody hurt? Oh, no, because the Lord stretched forth his hand to heal. And there were signs and there were wonders. No, I've not lost my mind. I'm expecting great things. Now, I don't like any of the garbage that's going on. I don't like the silly, stupid stuff that's being said and done right now. No, I don't like any of it. But let me tell you how I'm thinking about it. And maybe it'll help you to think about it the same way. I look at it like this. The worse they get, the more I'm expecting from God. In other words, I'm expecting the one who is more than enough to be more than their stuff. Did you get that? The one who is more than enough, I'm expecting him to be more than their stuff. You cannot outdo God. The devil has always tried to do that, and he always has lost, and we're going to watch him lose again. Absolutely we are. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. What I'm trying to say to you is this is where we're headed. I don't mean being put in prison. I don't mean people's lives being in danger. I don't mean that. Every prisoner walked out of that jail unharmed. Nobody was hurt. Nobody ran off. Some of them probably wanted to, but they didn't dare. But I mean the very things the ungodly think they control will be shaken loose by the power of God. I look forward to seeing these mighty creatures someday. 
Heaven is an amazing place. There's much more to it than we know and that we comprehend. And all of that, I'm telling you, went on in this vision. It's a short little passage, really. But wow, it's astounding. And it all made Isaiah feel kind of uncomfortable. And he said so. And then this is where we're going to wrap it up now. One of these seraphim flew toward Isaiah. He's got a live coal in his hand. Now, I used a charcoal grill for a long time to cook steaks. What I got now, it's gas. But never ever did I pick up You know what I'm about to say. This seraphim guy, he's got this thing in his hand. Seraphim have hands. Now he took these golden tongs and he took this thing off the altar and he put it in his hand. And then he laid it, he, he laid it on Isaiah's mouth. This, this seraphim can hold a live coal in his hand. He didn't reach a fire to get it. He took the tongs. He didn't want to mess things up there, you understand. He just wanted one of them. Put it in his hand, takes it to Isaiah. I don't know why this thing did not burn Isaiah to a crisp. Well, I do know why, really. It's, it's spiritual in nature, you understand. It's not from this natural world. And, and all of this represents a cleansing to prepare Isaiah for an assignment from God. Now, there's some commentators say, well, you know, the angel forgave Isaiah of his sin. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. Only God forgives sin. Amen. This angel, this seraphim, was delivering a very special message to Isaiah. That message was God's forgiven you. You're cleansed from your iniquity. So, we can conclude, with all of their other duties, the seraphim can also be messengers. They delivered a message to Isaiah that day. Now, there's no specific record of these angels, these seraphim, stepping over into this realm. You don't find that anywhere in the Bible. Isaiah had to look over into the realm of the Spirit. And he saw this awesome scene and these great angels. What an amazing thing to really even try to imagine. And yet what I've been talking to you about and just slowly bringing you along as you thought about this is something that goes on in the heavenlies all the time. Wow. Now, y'all might not like this because I'm about to mess up a song. And it's a cool song. But it's that song that's very popular. I can only imagine. And this guy is trying to imagine what he's going to do when he stands before the Lord. Well, I just read scriptures that told us what we're going to do. Come boldly. Uncovered face. Because as he is, so are we. In this world. Not trying to ruin the song for you, care, folks, but, but be careful what you embrace as gospel just because you like the song. That's the message I want to convey. Get your doctrine from the Word, not from some song written by somebody that didn't know as much as you know. 
Well, does that mean I got to throw that song away? No, just realize what you're listening to. While I'm at it, I might as well mess up another one. <laughs> we all love this song. But think about it in the light of what we've been talking about. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. The saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Who are we singing about here? We're singing about ourselves, aren't we? See how easy it is to get caught up in that. Well, are you never going to sing Amazing Grace again? I never said that. I realize that I'm singing about me. I'm singing about what I used to be. I'm singing about what I am now. Oh, but you also said you're praising yourself. Well, bless your heart. I'm pretty good compared to what I used to be. <laughs> Do you understand that? I have a right to be happy about where I am now compared to what I was. And, and some dear heart out here that lived a raunchy, horrible, terrible life of sin for years and then Jesus brought them up out of that and redeemed them from a life of sin. Man, when they sing Amazing Grace, they got a right to feel good about where they are now. You just got to understand you're not really worshiping the Lord when you're singing like that. That's the point of this whole thing. That's really what I've been trying. I've been using the subject of angels to actually teach you something else. And quite honestly, it's why you've been in so many services where, pardon me, the music did nothing for you. It left you empty. It left you wondering why did we spend an hour doing that? This gives you understanding of that. Just doing my job. Done. <laughs> Stand to your feet, please. I want to pray. Father, for all the toes that I stepped on, <laughs> give greater understanding. Thank you, Lord, for teaching us always. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us step by step into a deeper and a richer and a better understanding of the truth. We are worshipers. We diligently worship you in this place. We're focused on that. There are times when we praise you. There are times when we sing songs that inspire us. But it's what they do for us. But our ultimate goal is what our praise and our worship means to you. It's something that we present to you with the most sincere heart to really express to you what we understand about you and how much we love you and how dear you are to us. Thank you, Father, that you give us such an opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Now then, I've got some information for you. Then we're going to receive the offering. But I'll let you stay seated while I give this to you. If you need an envelope, lift your hand. The ushers will see that you get one. But I've got exciting news for you. And, and while you're busy about that, I'll just give you this information and say thank you, thank you, thank you to Rex. For what? All those tables up there, all those chairs up there. He set all that stuff up yesterday. 